we're going to start. Um, probably some more people will drift in, but it's just about 7.05, so we want to have plenty of time for both of these amazing uh, publishers to present, and then for our wonderful moderator to ask some questions. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before, and there are some new faces, I think, this is Asia Art Archive in America. Uh, we are the smaller sister satellite of the main Asia Art Archive, which is in Hong Kong, which is an organization that collects and preserves um, material, both first and second hand, about uh, contemporary art from Asia. And our office here, we have this very little space that we do these programs about twice a month where we invite interesting artists <coughs> and scholars and researchers to present to the New York audience work that we think is really vital and fascinating. Um, so this event that we're having tonight um, kind of came out of my visit to the New York Art Book Fair last year actually with Charmini Pereira, who is actually another um, independent art book publisher who has presented here in the past. And I noticed that there were all these great art book, artist books publishers coming out of Asia um, who came all this way, came from Taiwan, um, to the art book fair and weren't really maybe getting the spotlight I thought they deserved. So we thought that we would um, give them a little time to present about their work and about their history and to engage in a dialogue about the role of printed works and small presses in this kind of increasingly digital age. Um, so I'm just going to do a really brief introduction of our two presenters and our moderator tonight. Um, how this is going to work, we're going to hear from those books first, then Passenger Pigeon Press, then Megan Forbes is going to do um, a little bit of a panel discussion, and then we're going to open up for questions, and we really want people to ask questions, so don't be shy, write down what you're thinking while they're presenting, and then bring it up at the end. So, Nose Books is an independent publisher based in Taipei, in Taiwan, um, and they started in 2008 by Song Ni, um, and Che Hoi uh, joined her in 2014. Um, and they publish uh, unique book forms. And you're going to see they have very unique book forms. Um, and they collaborate with artists, um, as then they're both artists themselves. Uh, Tammy Wen, up here, uh, is the force behind Passenger Pigeon Press, which was founded recently in New York, um, and works to address geopolitics, scientists, and identity through visual arts and writing. And she not only collaborates with artists to create unique art book, artist books, but also has uh, Martha's Quarterly, which is a uh, ongoing publication that does collaborations, and um, you can subscribe to it. She'll tell you more, uh, so you can get updates about the various artists that she works with. And our moderator tonight is Megan Forbes, who is a CMAP fellow at MoMA and a visiting scholar at NYU's um, Institute for Public Knowledge. And she's also the founding editor of the small press, Harlequin Preacher. Um, and so she knows all of the struggles that these guys have faced and can ask them very probing questions about um, how their work has gone. So without further ado, we'll turn it over to Son and Shifoy. Um, this is the first book that Son did back in 2009. And uh, it's a very small booklet, uh, self-published, and it's called Mermaid. Uh, it's a comic book. Uh, it talks about some mermaids underwater searching for males. Mm -hmm. like, and then uh, it's a very funny and good drawing book that I discovered her work at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, at that time, uh, Flickr was very popular for young people, and we discovered many artists in Hong Kong and Taiwan on Flickr, sharing their works online. Uh, and then we got connected with some artists in Hong Kong and Taiwan. And that's how I discovered Sam's work also. Uh, at that time, when we post our work online, it would be like one some small work and without edit. So we start to edit our work. Yeah, because online you post something, it keeps looking new stuff and you forgot the past and you forget what you have done. 
but uh, with the book, there is an end to a certain project in your mind that you can put an end to it instead of uh, intermittently working on something you never know what you're going to get. Again. And that's why Stan started to publish for her friends uh, to make books and give a stop to her friends. <laughs> And this is one of the early books that we did um, with Phong B, our friend. And she's very good at drawing something quietly by herself. Yeah. And she's quite shy and timid when we want to show her work. And then we try to think of a way that she can present her work in a book, but at the same time, she can hide herself in the book, and mm -hmm. so we try to do the scratches, like a scratch lotto card that you hit, and to scratch the silver layer to reveal her hidden joints. Mm -hmm. And um, this is also one of an earlier book that we do. It's my work, it's called Dream Box. Um, before I got engaged in the work of North Box, I um, usually draw comics for newspaper and uh, publishers. And then uh, sometimes I do illustration column for a certain magazine in Hong Kong that I write and draw about the books I like. And then she found this topic very interesting and she proposed me to do this dream book uh, theme. Uh, in this book I draw maybe 10 or 12 favorite books that I really like a lot and some of them are real and some of them are, are fake, just some imaginary, imaginary books. Uh, for example, this uh, is a fictional fiction book called uh, the cliff of the asshole. <laughs> so somebody pushed some the other guy to the asshole. <laughs> and uh, this year I did a second volume of this series and uh, continue, because I encountered more and more books that I like and then I tried to draw more books that I like. And uh, Ting Chang is a very good friend of ours. She is a photographer and a video artist. And we publish her work in a very small, free flash card. Mm -hmm. Because she often do video clips, which are very funny, and she's also collecting many small stuff that we like a lot and she, she always install many different cute objects big or small to do her photo setting and so we do a flash card like this so the image can move a bit like a video clip like in a, in a gift bar and this is Sun's own work uh, she did a series of so, small drawings during her residency in San Francisco back in 2011. And um, we did this book with a uh, wizard graph on the pages. And uh, for the binding, we sent our printed stack of papers to the bindery factory. So we just work uh, with different factories for different kinds of binding or And she also do uh, some series of short comic stories, and, uh, and it's hard to find a way to find a better format that you can flip the pages easily and read the story easily. And uh, each time we test a lot of different papers and 
different texture of papers to to find the best way out. And, <laughs> and we had a second-hand risograph machine, and uh, because um, she just cannot eat so thin paper, but she wants to print things very thin paper, so lots of paper jam like this. <laughs> it's total waste. And Taiwan is very humid, so when you print it and leave them there for one or two days, the paper may curl a bit, especially in spring and summer. And then um, after this paper jam disaster, she do this. Uh, <laughs> she saved some waste paper to do in a small book, which is the first page of the of, of the book here. Uh, it's, um, it's the first page of the book, yeah. and I put every page the same, like it and make another book. And because the page is all sun, a three sun in the window, and because a result graph move. Uh, because the if you took, we have a only one color. It's like strong print. So if you print not correct, the they will move. Yeah. 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 So it looks like the sun keeps moving. <laughs> you know, I made another book called Internal Sun. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I said so. Yeah. Yes. And it's like a little prince uh, watching sunset. Eternally. <laughs> <laughs> so like uh, when we do books on the way, we can see other other ideas yeah. of our yes. yeah. And then after this uh, book, she developed a uh, kind of her standard format that she feel like doing it for her comics. So this year she do a second book of the comics, The Sun's Shadow. And um, each time if we have new problems to solve, we try to find find new machines that we can afford or second hand machines. Yeah. For example, in before we we didn't have an electric cutter, we just cut the books. Each by each page, page by page, and then uh, until we are better with that and until we, we don't have no time to handle that and then later we bought an electric cutter. Yeah. And, then and some stapler and this one is uh, the book by son's father and uh, she is uh, here it, her father is a normal office guy um, but uh, he's uh, quite a funny and creative man uh, that I respect a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, when her father was young, when son was little, six or six or seven. Seven, when she returned home, she would, she would find this bed sculpture for him on the bed of her parents. And uh, she was very interested in them. Oh, what's new today? <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. But never know what it was. And then, uh, I like, thought it was creative, <laughs> <laughs> more funny. Yeah, and then uh, like some 20 years later when she's published, publishing books with house books, she wanted to do um, both of these bad sculptures for her father, and so we hired a photographer to shoot them and ask her father to remake all the bad things for shooting. <laughs> And um, and her father get very excited. Okay, I can draw some more sketches and <laughs> practice with Why tissue paper before photo shooting. <laughs> and uh, when doing the photo shooting, <laughs> we do a lot of testing with some bedding. At first, we, did, we try to use these uh, old beddings, but then it doesn't work under the camera, so we chose the colored ones. Mm -hmm. And uh, when doing the bedding, her father 
the Saturday session. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's all about ASCE gates. Because we speak Mandarin, yeah. but suddenly he said SEX. SEX. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. And so, he confessed his uh, like an invitation to my home. <laughs> 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 because he feels something in the morning, he won't do it. And after my mom came home, she saw it, and she will feel. Mm, Okay, just we'll keep it. If not, you just destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the time I saw it with me. Yes, so I don't want to have it. <laughs> 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 and uh, this book is uh, the book of passion form. Uh, she's a singer. <laughs> and she is living in New York, and she is she did some very great work about the Met Museum. Or museums. Or museums. Yeah. Also MoMA. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the the original size of these large drawings are uh, pretty big, like three meters long by one meter height. And uh, we try to do a book with her, uh, with all the series of these drawings. And it's hard to scan them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because uh, Haisin just has a A4 scanner. <laughs> <laughs> and then we ask her, can you scan that for us? And she's OK, she's really productive. Scan like 100 something, no, 300, 300 something pages. And then we try to do by Photoshop auto merge, but it doesn't work really perfectly. So the image curves like this, and we cannot print that way. So we have to ask her, scan ask her to scan it in. <laughs> <laughs> and then we do the merging again by hand, mm -hmm. not by the Photoshop. And then, um, because this book, um, if we print this size, the people are still very small like this. But the people that she draws are really funny and characteristic that we want to want to show to the readers. So we add, so we also publish this tiny book at the same time, oh. showing all the little people oh. in the big joints. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then uh, a few years ago, we have bought a um, second-hand uh, hand press letter press, and we never used it, or we never had a chance to use it. So we decided to print this little book with the hand press, which is something <laughs> crazy idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Mentally and manually, physically. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, luckily, we have some uh, television friends that help us mm -hmm. out for troubleshooting, uh, setting. Uh, and things like that. And uh, with this book, we we can't just do it by our two persons. So we ask our oh, few of our friends to help us out, like folding the paper. And that's that's <laughs> the time we bought the paper folder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Every page we have to pick it, and in this book, it has fourteen. 14 session. <coughs> and then uh, we print the size, like paper size is like this, um, a basic size. And then uh, we we have to send to the bindery factory to do the binding for us because it's too tough work. And then we call them and ask them what size should we print, and then they say this size we can print, we can handle it. And then when we printed everything for the whole month, and then uh, we sent them the finished pages, and they said, no, 
it's double size we ask you to do it. Mm. <laughs> it's too small. It's too small. We, we cannot just put it in a big machine. Mm. It just flies away in pages. And then we were we were sweating all wet. All wet. Yeah, after like, the afternoon, what can we do? What can we do? What do, we do? Die. <laughs> and our face is turned green. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, we beg them, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> they didn't help us. They they can help us have. Yeah, they can, so help they can do the hand sewing part. With our machine, they do hand sew. But with the glue, we put together the uh, machine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we we did the hand sewing part. Yeah. 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 Y
And each time we write a statement and uh, make it flow plane. Yeah, yeah. Make we, are plane. Serious, uh, we are serious about that. It's a serious <laughs> yeah. gallery. Yeah. And uh, the other stuff we do <coughs> is to make out flyers for all the events that we participate. Uh, it's her idea basically, and she's doing it for fun. Mm -hmm. yes. More relaxing work <laughs> than yeah. real. Than the real than making the real book. Yes, yeah. and I can draw it really quick, but I really satisfied with the result. And I do three stuff. That, yes. <laughs> having some celebrations on November 1st, so if you're interested, we're having a big show with all of the artists that we've collaborated with over the year and a bunch of programming and things like that, so stay tuned for that. Um, like Hillary said earlier in the introduction, it is an independent publishing platform which aims to address geopolitics, science, and identity through visual art and writing. Um, passenger Pigeon Press takes its name after the Passenger Pigeon because I wanted to pick an animal symbol that is transnational in its migratory patterns, is appreciated for its beauty, and then killed in masses for sport and game. Um, this is an allegory for today's missteps in disregarding, erasing, and exploiting beautiful cultures and people also by the masses. Um, everything is made by hand, and there are four branches to this press. Um, the first branch, so you're going to see it right here, is the biggest project that Passenger Pigeon Press does. It's called Martha's Quarterly, and it's a quarterly subscription of four artist books a year. Martha is the name of the last passenger pigeon who died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. Um, each issue deals with an issue that is adjacent to today's most urgent topics. Um, so I'll talk about Martha's Quarterly in more detail later, but um, this was the first issue. This was the second issue, third, and fourth. The second branch of Passenger Pigeon Press is artist collaborations, where um, I do collaborations with artists who also work in trajectories that have not been popularized by the mainstream. This is the work by Didier Williams, Ronnie Quevedo, Aaron O'Brien, John Minduk, Mina Hassan, and Kenny Rivera. The third branch of Passenger Print and Press is the public domain, where um, I reproduce government documents from public archives that are relevant to today's geopolitical issues. Um, pictured here is the Law of the Sea negotiations. The Law of the Sea is an international treaty which defines the responsibilities of nations on how to use the world's oceans. Um, under President Gerald Ford, these documents show that the Committee for Negotiating the Law of the Sea was very concerned with the rights and control of deep sea mining. This is the second one. Um, this is the Clinton radio address. Um, so recently, uh, June 1st, uh, President Trump withdrew from the Paris Agreement. And um, I thought it was fitting to also reproduce uh, this uh, radio address in which President Clinton um, sort of warned about global warming and its urgency. Um, one thing that caught my attention about this document is that all the language alterations made by his speech team aim to make a stronger connection between climate change and economic necessity. So the last three branches of the press that I've just told you about 
um, has a lot of pricing consideration, which I think is integral to the way that this press functions. Um, all of the Marcus quarterlies, which are um, usually done through letterpress printing combined with Xerox, um, it's $25 for an entire year of handmade books. All of the artist collaborations are $100, under $100, and then the public domain um, books are all 15 So we're obviously not making any money with that. Um, but th this leads me to the fourth branch of Passenger Pigeon Press, which are custom projects. Um, so right here um, is a finely made uh, leather slipcase with two twin suede books. So these are projects that we take on, which funds um, the political projects of the last three different, uh, the last three branches that I mentioned. Um, the other thing that I also make a lot of are um, wedding invites. <laughs> um, that that um, that pays. And um, here's an example. Do you guys have any friends getting married for birthdays? Or mitzvahs. Here's another one. <laughs> Here's another one. Um, so, in or I want to sort of talk about the impetus for creating Passenger Pigeon Press, um, and it, it all kind of stems from my own personal uh, studio practice. Um, and I think of Passenger Pigeon Press as being an extension of it. Um, my larger studio practice is devoted to telling complex stories that are often dealing with the geopolitics of the global south, especially Southeast Asian places, and usually um, I deal with topics that are in friction with the West. Um, so pictured here is um, a picture of Denang City. Um, I usually uh, do a lot of field work when I work on a large project. Um, so this is a picture where um, I'm standing from Suncher Mountain, which I'll talk about a little bit more. It's overlooking China Beach, which was the first point of contact for American soldiers at the beginning of the Vietnam War. This here is a picture of the Red Shank Duke Langer, and this picture is something that I took also on Suncher Mountain, but it's more in the... Um, in the jungle, and um, it, is a, it is a species of primate that lives on the mountain. This is a picture of my painting studio. Um, so um, when I do the research and stuff like that, I bring all of this stuff back to the studio where I make art in a variety of different ways. It usually includes painting. There's a lot of drawing. There's a lot of writing and collage and printmaking. Um, after I sort of do a bunch of research in reading sort of <coughs> government documents, um, different kinds of um, academic literature, and also doing the field work, I start to um, write fiction. I usually don't know how the stories will turn out, but I write and make work and images and stuff like that until something congeals. Um, this is one of my pieces on the Van der Cook Press before it was being printed. I do um, all of my letterpress printing at the Center for Book Arts on 27th Street. Um, I do some of my other printing on my little etching press at home, and then I have another proofing press, and of course I do um, some printing with uh, just a baron. So there's a reduction print, and then that's like a sketch of it. I make large artist books, so these are two of them, which um, are here today. You can look at them after the talk. Um, they're just resting in there after the glue and everything has been applied. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about two large projects and then go back to Martha's Quarterly because they're kind of interrelated. So for the last three years, I was working on a large narrative called Primate City. Um, and Primate City is, um, there's a lot of different pieces that are a part of the narrative, but one of the main pieces is that I created a duet of artist books. So pictured here is a facsimile of a 1969 U.S. military intelligence document. This is the first page. Um, the document was um, something that I found in 2010 when I was living in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, and I found it at, at the original document at an old Saigon bookstore. The document was a U.S. military intelligence plan to reconstruct Da Nang as a second metropolis to Saigon. Um, in it, it criticized Saigon for being what they called a primate city. So that term is already provocative. Um, but they define a primate city as a city that is so absorbent of a nation's resources that it stifles the health of the whole. Um, so 
what I did was um, later on in uh, 2013, I took the original document and traveled to Da Nang City and surveyed the land um, using the maps and literature that was in the document. Um, there in Da Nang, I met with a primatologist who taught me about the monkeys. And so um, over the course of a couple weeks, I spent time in the sites that, the, that this plan specifies, but then I also spent a lot of time looking for the red shanked Duke Langers. And my hopes at the time was to somehow create a fiction that could combine the biology of these endangered species with the content of this military document. Um, this is another picture of one, um, one of the spreads in there. So what you're looking at is a green vellum that has been stitched into um, these photocopies that I stained with um, Dunkin' Donuts coffee and um, collaged into the vellum pages are um, little plants that I cut that were based on um, observational drawings that I'd made in the in the forest where I was just making little ink drawings of the different plants and stuff like that. But then what I did was I cut them into um, the Nam comics, which was a Marvel comic book series that was sort of this, I don't know, very hyperbolized way of speaking about the Vietnam War from an American perspective. Coupled with that facsimile is this monkey. So this is an artist book that takes the shape of a red shanked Duke Langer. It's not the same colors as the monkey. It um, aims to sort of be a camouflage in, into uh, the forest. Um, so you open the Langer up by opening up its body. And um, in it, um, I offer you a fiction that I wrote and illustrated. And um, I tell you about the Langers. And one remarkable fact that I tell you about these creatures is that they move together in families. And that they can only move through the canopies of trees because they do not have the cognitive ability to touch the ground. And so when you're looking for the monkeys in uh, Suntra Mountain, um, you see this, uh, this very sad phenomenon. So what happened was in 1997, Vietnam opened up for ecotourism. And as a result, <coughs> these resorts started moving into Da Nang. And then there's this one resort on one side of the mountain. And they needed to build a road that was wide enough for taxi cabs to come in to show for guests from the city. And as a result of the road being built, and like I said, the Langers can't touch the ground, you see this situation where one side of the road will feature some Langers of the same family looking across the road at their other family members, and they don't understand why they can see each other, but they cannot touch. Um, some uh, conservationists have tried to create canopies, but because of the weather um, in Vietnam, those um, are not very permanent. Um, so that's one thing that I feature in this fiction. Another thing that I tell you about in this story is that Da Nang City is situated at 16 degrees latitude straight across from the contested Paracel Islands. Um, there has been a theory that if a power could control Da Nang, that they could control the entirety of the South China Sea. And that is because they could control the Paracel Islands. Um, and so I kind of suggest that perhaps this is why that Da Nang City has been the first point of contact for so many colonial powers. On a formal note, um, I really like and enjoy playing with repetitive shapes. And so I like repeating things with different kinds of papers. I like repeating things in different formats and stuff like that. So in this case, um, the eye of the monkey um, is the same shape consistently throughout the book. So the, the shape of the eye that is featured on the cover of the book um, here is replicated and is meant to suggest islands, but it's the same thing as the eye. And then the eyes are also um, oil paper, so it is also um, suggestive of why the sea might be contested. I also created a villain, and um, her name is Dana Ng, which is a play off of Da Nang City. She's a little Chinese fairy who carries a Chinese last name and a Western first name. Um, she's actually based on a local myth in Da Nang. So Sir 
Sunshine Mountain is a plateau, which made it a really good place for helicopters to land. But according to this local legend, um, the mountaintop is flat so that fairies can come down to play chess, the classic sort of board game of, of war. Um, Dina Ng, the villain, likes to suck the eyeballs out of the langers and keep them in a bubble tea cup. This is one of the paintings. Um, and then she shoots them out of her straw at the sites in the 1969 U.S. Milita military document that the United States have deemed as obsolete, um, sites that would prevent Da Nang from modernizing. Um, one thing that I really like about working in between painting and artist books is the ability to create very malleable metaphors. So in this in this painting, in this framing, Dana Ng is no longer a girl. She's part of the landscape. She becomes a force of nature. So there's something going on in there that um, allows her to breathe a different life in painting. Similarly, I like the idea of inverting landscape and character a lot. So um, this is something that I'm playing with thematically throughout other different stories in my work too, where the, char the main character or the villain or whatever um, will become the mountains that shoot the cannons out of the sea, or the mountains that become the sea, or the volcanoes that erupt. Here's another painting. A lot of my friends have children, so um, I often cast them as the characters in my paintings. So this is Sabine Shea, and those are her thumbs up uh, approval after the painting was made. This is a story I'm working on now. I've been thinking a lot about the apocalypse and um, the next species of people that I imagine might occupy the planet. I'm thinking about trade, I'm thinking about climate, I'm thinking about nations, and I'm thinking about flags. One of my inspirations for the stories right now are these fake islands that are being built um, in the sea. Um, these, are, these are the pictures of the, Chi the Chinese islands in the South China Sea. Um, which are made out of sand. I've been thinking a lot about coral, too, and the myth of Medusa. Um, after she was beheaded by Perseus, um, <coughs> it's believed that her blood became the red of the, of, the, of the red coral sea. Another um, thing that I'm playing with right now are the flags of convenience. The Flags of Convenience is a business practice where merchant ships registered in a country other than that of its own ship owners. So they'll fly a flag of another nation um, in order to sort of be exempt from various, um, um, I don't know, various rules and taxes and things like that. Um, this story, this, 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 this culture of the Flags of Convenience also strikes a chord with me because um, the idea of flags being flown in the sea that are unbound by the nations that they represent is really fascinating to me. Um, it reminds me of a little uh, vignette that my father once told me about when he was uh, a refugee. He said that they were, they were out at sea for a number of days and um, everyone was very dehydrated and um, a merchant ship um, sprayed their boat with water. And so there's something in there that I haven't quite figured out yet, but something about being nationless, something about using a flag to represent something other than what it is, um, is interesting to me. I'm not sure where it's going yet, but this is something I'm working on now. These are some characters that I'm thinking about. Um, so they're like connected by the belly button, and I'm imagining that the next species of people on the planet aren't going to have any gender. They're just going to be connected by the belly button and each person is birthed out of a singular hole that everyone has. So everyone just has a hole for everything. Um, so in that way they grow like coral, cloning over and over again. Um, these were some sketches that I did really, really early, like about a year ago or something like that. I don't think I'm going to keep this idea anymore, but I've always wanted to do a project with brand names. I don't think it's going to last in this one, but um, it, I'm still marinating that story. Oh, and the shoes, right? Um, the shoes, uh, 
I've always wanted to turn like uh, athletic shoes into guns or cannons, but I'm also not sure about how that might play out either. But I, I tried it for these photographs. <laughs> Another thing I'm playing right now is, is um, Atlas. So after this planet ends, I still imagine that the next planet will be held by Atlas. And um, this is a painting of Atlas's hands multiplying and holding up all of the islands of the next planet. Here's a painting of a character that I'm playing with. And here's another one. They might become giants, I'm not sure. And this is a landscape. So um, this is my greater, like, I guess, larger studio practice, which it exists in a really different way than making books. And um, despite that, I still want to get these complicated, nuanced stories out to a larger public. And um, so last year, when I started Passenger Pigeon Press, I started to think about if, you know, what, what could I do to make stories be more accessible to people. And I started thinking about how popular paper source has been mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. and how much time I spend in these spaces um, just looking at paper and like tape and cards and, you know, things like that. And then I also started to think about the <coughs> gift shop at the Met and stuff like, what do you, how do you take the story home? You go to the gift shop, you buy a book, you might give it to a friend. You buy a postcard, you might give it to a friend. You buy a painting that's been turned into a scarf and then you wear it or, you know, there's so many different ways of, you know, a story that is so exclusive when it's in the confines of a museum and then it's changed in these wonderful ways through um, these sort of um, commercial spaces. Um, I also thought about how a work of art could exist in a person's home. Like, there's only so much wall space. Where else could there be a Trojan horse for, for a political issue? You know, like where where would a work of art exist in this space? Could it, I'm, I'm I'm looking at those bookshelves right there, or maybe that giraffe, or maybe this living room. So this was all in the sort of thinking behind Passenger Pigeon Press. So this is the first one. Uh, this is Mark's Quarterly Issue One, Fall 2016. It is called The Wild Pigeon of North America by Chief Pogon. Um, Chief Pogon was an activist, writer, and a poet who fought for the fair treatment of Native American people. And this is um, an, an old article where he describes his awe for what we know now as the passenger pigeon. And he also accounts for the way that white Americans were killing the species by the masses. He compares this to the way that his own people were killing the bird while also ensuring the species, um, the species sustainability. Um, I thought this was fitting to become the inaugural issue of this zine because the title alludes to precarious issues within today's environmental um, issues and also how we care for different people. Um, it's an accordion book. Um, the, so the cover that you saw earlier was a letterpress print. The pages on the inside are uh, laser cut, all those little yellow flamey birdy looking things. And then um, the gray paper is just a, a Xerox photocopy. Um, the pieces that fold out, like right there, those are the hinges which keep the whole entire book together. So this, there's actually many different spines within each uh, folio. This is Martha's Quarterly Issue 2, Cicada Practices. So this, this issue was inspired by the labor rights lawyer and professor at John Angie's book, Ties That Bind. So in this book, she described a phenomenon called uh, cicada practices, which is when business owners set up a factory and then completely evacuate the premises, um, deserting the workers without compensation. So then the book opens up. And there's a portfolio which presents the writing by um, journalist Kevin Collier, who um, reports on an incident of cicada practices by a Korean company in Vietnam. Then that writing is juxtaposed to a description of the life cycle, uh, life cycle of the insect cicada um, by the evolutionary biologist Sam Snow. 
then nestled in between those two um, writings is a poem by Tanashi Mushakabenhu, who writes a poem about being unable to find peace within daily life. So these are all, uh, these are letterpress, and um, they're printed in such a way where um, I just keep adding ink to the press, so when you actually read the book, the purple turns into green as you keep flipping the pages. This is the third issue. It's called Sky Glow and the Desert Fox, and it was inspired by a Financial Times article by um, Nilanjana Roy. Uh, it's called The Dark Side of Too Much Light, where she describes sky glow as a phenomenon where the night sky is brightened over, inha uh, over inhabited areas. Um, so in, it, in this article, she talks about how light, this type of sky glow has lengthened the human's workday, which allows for more productivity. Um, it's allowed for more interaction and connection into the darkest hours of night. Yet at the same time, the light is also the sublime light of pollution, which is what I would say is like the child of oil and man. So I took this idea of sky glow and thought about it in relationship to the light of Orientalist paintings in the 19th century. Um, those images uh, were some of the first cinematic Im imaginations of the brown and black body as discovered by European explorers. And then at the same time this issue was coming out, Trump had denounced EPA, the EPA, he had implemented an immigrant ban, and comparisons between his administration to Hitler's was viral. So considering all of that, I invited um, Andrew Stein, who's a historian, to write about the Desert Fox, also known as Commander Erwin Rommel, who led some of the Nazi operations in World War II in Morocco, Algeria, and Egypt. These are the locales of some of the Orientalist paintings. Then, the cover features the work by Emma Colbert, who's a naturalist and is traveling across Europe in a motorhome. So she created this portrait of the Desert Fox, whom Rommel is named after, while looking across the Strait of Gibraltar from Spain onto Morocco. This is a map of North Africa and parts of the Mediterranean. And then Emma is also traveling with the poet Andrew Hughes, who I invited to respond to the idea of sky glow with a poem. Um, just to give you an idea of how the poem sounds, um, this is the second stanza. In the dying of the night, it seems, we lose an ancient foe. For once, a gleam cannot expose that darkness should not glow. And this is the most recent issue. This is Martha's Quarterly issue four. It's called uh, Giant Balloons. And it was inspired by new technologies in geoengineering. So geoengineering is a deliberate, large-scale manip manipulation of an environmental process that affects the Earth's climate in an attempt to counteract the effects of global warming. So these are pretty, like, crazy things. Um, there's this one technology called biochar, which is basically when you cook waste agricultural products, such as plant stems, stalks, <coughs> roots, to make charcoal out of them, then you bury it, and then that's taking the carbon it contains out of circulation. Another one is called ocean pipes, which is a system of giant vertical pipes that, are, that they kind of like bob up and down in the ocean. So each pipe is around 500 feet long, and then each one has a valve at the top and the bottom, and then as it, moved as it moves downward, cold water would rush at the bottom, and then when it bobs up again, the cold water would spill out. So it's really, really sort of invasive technologies on our planet uh, in efforts to cool it down. So when this artist book opens up, there's a presentation of, um, and one of them is a description of geoengineering by biologist Pinel Dimbaru. Next to his writing is the preface to Novum Organum, which is the paradigm-shifting text by Francis Bacon, where he deems nature as something for men to use as opposed to inhibit. And then finally, there is a poem by a nine-year-old boy named Chase Marshall who describes watching the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. He describes all the balloons with a sense of awe 
but the balloons are our cultural icons, such as Shrek, Popeye the Sailor. So then, the gaze of a young child looking up at a phenomenon similar to nature, but in this case, the phenomenon is um, our own making. And that's it. magazine or book or, or sort of insufficient terms in, in sense. Um, but uh, the way these objects that you're creating are used uh, to enact networks across uh, space and also um, amongst people. And uh, the other thing that I'm really interested in your work is just these forms and technologies that you're using uh, to make and then distribute these books. Um, so I was at the art book fair, which is lovely, I met you there, and uh, I picked up this book called No ISBN on Self-Publishing, and I thought that it would be useful for me to kind of breeze through it and see if there were things that uh, kind of sparked ideas for what, we want, what I want to talk about today with you. Um, and one of the things in here is a manifesto from Ulysses Caron, and I thought I would just start reading a very short uh, passage from it that really struck me as also speaking to the, some, some of the issues that you're all engaging with, at least it seems to me. Uh, so this is a manifesto that he wrote in 1975, and it was published in the Mexican journal Plural, and then was translated into English, and this is just, a, the, just the beginning of the larger um, work called The New Art of Making Books, and so this part is just what a book is. Um, so, a book is a sequence of spaces. Each of these spaces is perceived at a different moment. A book is also a sequence of moments. A book is not a case of words, nor a bag of words, nor a bearer of words. A writer, contrary to popular opinion, does not write books. A writer writes texts. The fact that a text is contained in a book comes only from the dimensions of such a text, or in the case of a series of short texts, poems, for instance, from their number. A literary prose text contained in a book ignores the fact that the book is an autonomous space-time sequence. A series of more or less short texts, poems, or other distributed through a book following any particular ordering reveals the sequential nature of the book. It reveals it, perhaps uses it, but it does not incorporate it or assimilate it. Written language is a sequence of signs expanding within the space, the reading of which occurs in the time. A book is a space-time sequence. Books existed originally as containers of literary texts, but books seen as autonomous realities can contain any written language, not only literary language or even any other system of signs. Among languages, literary language, prose and poetry is not the best fitted to the nature of books. A book may be the accidental container of the text, the structure of which is irrelevant to the book. These are the books of bookshops and libraries. A book can also exist as an autonomous and self-sufficient form, including perhaps a text that emphasizes that form, a text that is an organic part of that form. Here begins the new art of making books. In the old art, the writer judges himself as being not responsible for the real book. He writes the text. The rest is done by the servants, the artisans, the workers, and others. In the new art, writing a text is only the first link in the chain going from the writer to the reader. In the new art, the writer assumes the responsibility of the whole process. In the old art, the writer writes text. In the new art, the writer makes books. To make a book is to actualize its ideal space-time sequence by means of the creation of a parallel sequence of signs, be it linguistic or other. And I really see 
you all fitting into this new art, the book as a, con really thinking about the book form as a container that is all encompassing and uh, you're so thoughtful about the forms that the books uh, take um, to project a certain mission with the books. And so I thought it might be nice to start just by laying out a vocabulary, like what, uh, you know, there are the words like quarterly or book or, uh, or broth or, or pamphlet, but what are the ways that you think about your objects? Do you think of them as uh, magazines or, or how do you think about these objects um, and how do you use them to kind of um, uh, generate a certain message? Which is something that you've talked about a bit, but um, is this where you, is this the place from which you start? We <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, with regard to the term quarterly, mm -hmm. um, I, I I think a lot about lap hands quarterly, mm -hmm. which is one thing that I I subscribe to, and then the other one I think about is the Paris Review. Uh -huh. So those are two mass produced books mm -hmm. that I um, think a lot about when I was starting to brand what these objects would be, right? Mm -hmm. I think that they um, they have a kind of tenderness. So the, there's a kind of tenderness to the word quarterly, something that arrives in each season. Um, so I really mm -hmm. liked that. And I also liked that the, the idea of quarterly, um, I, I really like vignettes. Mm -hmm. Like I really like novellas that are, that are assembled in a vignette kind of in a way. And so when I think about quarterlies, I think about the whole shelf that's filled with these episodes mm -hmm. that take over time and that all of them end up becoming like this giant novel or something. Mm -hmm. So I guess in that way, that's how I was thinking about mm -hmm. deciding. <coughs> and then each one has a different form, like yeah. the accordion binding or this thing that's kind of a... Uh, what would you call it? Like an, almost like a notebook, um, the, the second one. Uh, yeah, well, that was like a portfolio. Portfolio. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the format of them, um, it depends on the topic. Mm -hmm. So I so quarterly is like this, that's like the semiotics that exist around the mm -hmm. objects, right? And then there's the objects that I think, it just depends on what it is. And it also depends on really practical things that I've learned. Like cicada practices, like I've learned a lesson in size. like. Mm -hmm. Like it costed way too much to to mail them, you know. So then those are little like logistics that become really important. Like I can't really make a quarterly that's like over six by nine because that, mm -hmm. you know. So there's a like, formal decisions that happen. Um, yeah. I guess um, the book is an uh, object with limitation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, when we make a book, we don't want the format to override the content or the content to override the format. So it's time we dis discuss with the artists and see what suits them. And the interaction is quite organic with the artists. Mm -hmm. so my, the book of my father, some quarterly books, such as Oh, you can print on fabric, or you can do uh, like a pillow or something. But I will feel it's um, so over the topic. So, so it's this is kind of uh, distance is hard to decision. <laughs> <laughs> you say the book is an object of limitation, but that's what you seem to delight in or maybe not maybe you're it's miserable in the moment but all these uh, ta tales of error or failure are really the thing that seems to inform the structure that the books ultimately take I, I like I don't know I like mm -hmm. I like shifts constraints yes mm -hmm. I think I like I like to things on <laughs> <laughs> and at the same time, though, pushing back at the constraints of maybe the machine, walk, like the Rizzo. Maybe walk, um, like here is the constraint, but walk <laughs> without <laughs> it. <laughs> Not for it. For example, the, the, the book with the scratches, mm -hmm. um, she had this idea to hide the joints mm -hmm. underneath. And 
for the paper material, she likes newsprint paper, but the printer refused to print that way on the newsprint paper because mm -hmm. he says he says um, the paper would absorb absorb too much ink that she can scratch, mm -hmm. and then she had another solution is to print on a um, transparent sticker and then you print the silver ink to, to cover the joint and then uh, to stick on the little print book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how she overcome the limitation <laughs> of the material. Yeah. And uh, the printer said, okay, I can try print to print mm -hmm. on the sticker. Let's see what we do. I wanted to add that I think spines are really important yeah. in bookmaking. Like, yeah. I feel like the search for where a spine goes in terms of how to unify a sequence mm -hmm. is, I think, a really generative idea mm -hmm. in trying to find what object it ends up being. But mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that. Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. And also to something you said earlier about the post and like the limitations of the books also working with constraints, <coughs> I guess, is something that I observed. Um, uh, also, well, so both of you are working in these very um, tactile material forms. You're working with these print objects, but also obviously have an online presence. It was really interesting to learn that you both somehow met, you know, through Flickr and the work that you're putting online. That seems to be, at least in the work that we're talking about tonight, very explicitly in the material. Mm -hmm. And so I, for one, love to mail things and play with the mail. And I, I, so I was thinking about that as I was preparing these questions. How does the post office sort of like facilitate or hinder these like broad networks that you're actually reaching amongst collaborators and uh, people who are purchasing? And I noticed uh, on your website when I went to it uh, a few weeks ago, it was diff something had changed when I went to it last night, which was that now I had to agree that there was going to be a delay if I wanted to buy one of your books that I understood that you were in New York and there would be a delay. <laughs> So it seems like you're both really actually re wrestling with that that institution we may all love to hate to the, the post office. Yeah. <laughs> um, the last mark is quarterly. I um, I decided to buy a weight. I was like, I'm going to do this myself. Mm -hmm. I'm going to figure out how many stamps it needs, weigh it, put the stamps on, mm -hmm. and then mail it out. And um, I did it in two batches. The first batch. I gave to the lady at the post office, mm -hmm. and then the second batch I just threw in a mailbox. And the second batch made it, and the first batch that I gave to the lady all came back to me and they said there wasn't enough postage on it. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The post office staff in Taiwan are really nice people. <laughs> yes, every time we learn something new from home. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of them, so <laughs> but surely somebody else can. Um, well, I guess, oh wait, no, you go first. I'm first. Um, this is a very Close to 200 by now. How do you? Yeah. <laughs> how do you make out this many books? Like, how much of this work is hand labor? It's all hand. Yeah. It's, it's, how do you do that? It's messed up. <laughs> so messed up. Um, and it's not the only thing you're doing no, either. I don't. It's, it's messed up. It's like really. It's. I don't know. I I, I have some help now, but yeah. Um, yeah. It's, pretty um, it's a lot of work. 
I don't know what else to say about it. <laughs> um, lots of jigs, though. There's a lot of jigs. There's a lot of tricks in it. So there's like folding jigs. So each book has like a folding jig. So like fold. I mean, it ends up it ends up being like a week for everything. Like oh, it takes one week to produce one to produce two hundred marches quarterly in general. But it's because of the system of different jigs. So are you talking about from the printing? Everything has like a different jig. So I kind of figure out the math beforehand. Like uh -huh. oh, okay, so that'll take me like four hours. That's gonna take me like eight hours. And so then with that, I'm like, well, if I set up the jig in this way or whatever, then I can jump from this folding part to this punching part, and I can get to the end by 10 p.m. or what, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you have some idea, because you are doing other things, and like, do you have some idea of like, okay, I'm going to budget this amount of time for each issue? Or yeah, is it just... Every, it's very budgeted. Yeah. Very, it's like, it's very, it's, it's tight. Mm -hmm. It's like, I've got this day to print. I'm going to print today. I'm going to get it done today. Tomorrow is going so to be one of these issues you yeah. print in one day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it gets it, it's mm -hmm. like streamlined. Mm -hmm. Or like I'll I'll like email something to a photocopier, print the letterpress, <laughs> walk to the photocopier, pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's like that. <laughs> do, you, I'm sorry, <laughs> do you make a, a lot of dummies like before you go into the production of that final? Yeah, there usually is a dummy out of like scotch tape and like mm -hmm. photocopy paper and stuff like that. Um, I've gotten better though. Like I, I've gotten a lot. Like I've, like the next part this quarterly. Like the next part of the quarterly is gonna. You guys want to know? Um, <laughs> it's gonna be a. It's gonna be a mask, and it has a ribbon that binds all of the things. So the mask. If you take everything apart, then the ribbon allows you to wrap the paper around your face and transforms mm -hmm. you into um, an animal. Um, but that binding is like really easy. It's just a hole. I mean, it's just you know, like it, it sounds really dramatic, but it's just like a hole. So like those little things, I'm getting better at, and they they end up taking less time. And then I also have help now, so that's really good. I think you had a question. I did have a question. Well, because um, you know, in thinking about this event, it was thinking about the choice of physical over digital, mm -hmm. and um, and you brought up Tammy kind of the monetary aspect of this, mm -hmm. that this costs money to mm -hmm. print these, and to your time costs money to hand make all of these, and I'm sure you guys know all of those times you tried to, you know, <laughs> make the perfect fit, and then you had to deal with the binder and everything. So, I mean, you know, I guess I just wanted to ask, how do you work through that in maybe how there's increasing pressure on the digital side mm -hmm. to, you know, just put them out so cheap and free, and that people are also, I think, less willing to, I don't know, value physical objects because they can, you know, they just want something online and to read it for free, read this text, you know, watch this video even. Um, so how do you push back against that and even just like the, um, the mechanics of trying to convince people that, you know, this is something worth <coughs> taking up space in their, in their house? It's a Trojan horse in their house that they have to make space for. They can't just keep it on the cloud or whatever. So um, I was interested in, in your thoughts about that. <laughs> like, but was it successful at Art Book Fair? Yeah, exactly. Even just that. Yes, yes, we do So, but that seems like a lot of work for you guys. You have to come all the way from yeah. Taiwan and you, you go to other fairs. Is that an, an enjoyable interaction with the people in public, or is that just a slog of having to do this? <laughs> I think it's more happier to join the field okay. to see the people bite mm -hmm. and how they bite mm -hmm. and it's interesting and how they see books. Mm -hmm. Maybe some are really precious and some are like using two fingers. So even both people who are engaged and people who are maybe not so engaged, you, you enjoy both In the uh, uh, <coughs> books or things online, because I, I, didn't, I didn't really think about people like 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-hmm.